Um, just a little bit about my job. I work out of the NRCS offices and I'm supposed to be the wildlife authority so um, I come meet with each and every one of you personally after this workshop. The idea behind this is kind of just uh, I want to go over some some of these habitat practices and uh, get you all to kind of think about what your goals are for your property. And that way when I meet with you or one of our other private land biologists meets with you later on, we can get a game plan down um, and I can help get you in the doors of the NRCS office for cost share to, to uh, implement some of those practices. Um, I got Tyler Bass in the back. He's my equivalent in uh, Warren and Madison counties. Um, all these pictures you see over here and shed antlers spread out all over the place are from his personal farms. And uh, he's a good resource to have here because um, he personally does a lot of these practices that I'll be talking about on his own properties. Uh, he's got pheasant, he's got quail, he's got deer, he's got turkey, and he's got plenty of them. So that's kind of the proof in the pudding that you don't just have to manage for deer, you don't just have to manage for turkey, etc. If you have good wildlife habitat, you can have anything. Um, so with that, we'll get started. If my clicker works. So when I say bridge the gap, that's just a way of me saying, I don't want you to think about deer management. I don't want you to think about turkey management. Just like I said earlier, think wildlife. How can we benefit multiple species with our management practices on our farms? Um, so let's call it holistic wildlife management. And that's using practices that benefit multiple species. And throughout the presentation, I'll kind of tie these practices all in together and, and you know give you some proof on how uh, how doing this helps all of that and etc. So when we talk wildlife they're just like us they need certain things shelter nutrition are the big two um, you guys need a bed to sleep in just like wildlife do and you need to eat dinner every night and breakfast every morning to keep going food water security space is what we're going for. And in Iowa, that generally means uh, forest, timber, um, old fields. And when I refer to old fields, I'm talking about more open spaces that's not crop ground. So your, your old pasture, um, natives, you know, native warm season grasses, cool season grasses, forbs, um, fallow fields, weeds, shrubs, etc. Also in Iowa, we need food. Uh, we have plenty of waste grain across our landscape, as you guys know, but not as much as we used to. Um, you look out and you see those clean farm fields, and, and so sometimes we need to supplement a little bit of food on our properties to, to kind of keep our, our wildlife um, fed. Uh, browse, insects, and water, and a diverse mixture of all of those is going to be your best bet. Uh, some of the practices I'll be going over, timber stand improvement, also known as TSI, I'll refer to it as TSI throughout the rest of the presentation, so you know what I'm talking about when I say that. Hinge cutting, edge feathering, native grasses and forbs, switchgrass, tree and shrub plantings, food plots, cover crops, and oak savanna. Timber stand improvement is the first thing we'll talk about, uh, and you see the picture up there. It's a bunch of fairly young trees that are all choked out because there's too many of them in one area. Um, you can see clear through that timber and generally wildlife do not like that. It'd be like you living in a glass house. You don't want people looking at you all the time. Wildlife, deer, turkey, whatever you want to, whatever you want to refer to, they don't like being looked at all the time. Can you guys see these pictures okay? Are they yeah. <clears throat> plenty in focus? Um, so this is just a little TSI project. You can kind of see on the left-hand side here, it's, it's pretty open. It's not as bad as some of the areas. That's hey, a little bit. Thanks, Jeff. Um, it's not as bad as a lot of areas. You know, we have a lot of like what I call bottom ground timber in Iowa that you can see clear through. I mean, you sit in there with a muzzleloader and you can shoot 250 yards if you're accurate. 
Um, and on the right is after they did a little TSI, you can see some of the marked trees that they decided to save. Um, normally a forester will go in and mark the trees for you and, and he'll mark the trees based on what you want to do. If you're looking for harvesting timber, you know, then obviously what you'll do is you'll mark the good trees, walnuts, you know, whatever you want to, whatever it is that you have a value. Um, if you're looking to benefit wildlife, you know, I know guys that will do TSI for pod producing locusts. I mean, we all know they're nasty trees, but they are a legume, they provide food. Um, and you can also do TSI for restoration purposes, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So you see this tree, uh, this is a hickory, and so this person is obviously doing TSI for mast production because they've killed this hickory tree and they've marked the white oaks to save. And what that does is that hickory is competing with that tree for sunlight. Once you kill that, it's still going to be standing for a while, but it's not going to have the leaf cover. And so that, those oak trees there are going to get more sunlight, they're going to produce more acorns, and we all know how valuable acorns are to wildlife. And it does another thing too, um, this is actually a hinge cut tree, but you can see after it was killed, or after it was cut down, all these brows, these shoots here, deer love that. Deer are browser animals first. They're not grazers like we think because we see them out in the hay fields, out in the corn and bean fields. That's the stuff that gets them through the year in March, February, when their food's depleted. Um, so you want to have some of that. So some of the benefits, like I said earlier, increases mass production, more light to an oak equals more acorns. It creates browse for deer, um, and it starts succession over on the forest floor, and there's a word you'll see a lot in my presentation, diversity, um, that benefits all wildlife. And uh, better bedding for deer, obviously when you got thick nasty stuff on the ground and you know eventually it's going to grow up to some other thick nasty stuff, that's good cover both you know for security and for thermal purposes, it helps keep them warm. And like I said, TSI can help with timber sale. Um, and it'll help with the growth of, of your valuable, valuable trees in the future. Uh, so you can kind of get on a plan to, to selectively harvest, you know, over time. Hinge cutting is the next thing I'll talk about, and, and I just want to start off. This is not timber stand improvement, um, but you can kind of see the, the dense, nasty areas that it creates. It's not pretty, <laughs> it's ugly, but wildlife like it because you get things like, uh, I'll just show you quick in this slide. This is a four-year-old area that's grown up to blackberries. I don't know, I don't know a single animal in Iowa that, that won't benefit from, from, from some berry production. Songbirds, pheasant quail, deer like that stuff too. Um, but again, you're doing this to create bedding and thermal cover. Um, and you need to be selective about where you do your hinge cutting. And uh, you don't want to go in and hinge cut a bunch of oaks or, or something like that. If you have an area that you know, you're not doing much with and you're not sure, well, should I do TSI or should I just doze it so I can put in a food plot, this is a good thing to do. Um, there's the diversity word again. It increases diversity, security for all wildlife. And uh, if, if you're a deer guy, like I know a lot of you are, you can use hinge cuttings, big trees like that laying on the ground to kind of funnel your deer. Um, and it can also create timber openings, which uh, provide some short vegetation for use by you know, quail, turkeys, etc. There's just a couple pictures. Um, like I said, this is a four-year-old area. You can see how thick that is. That'd be a great bedding area for deer. Um, depending on where it's located, if you had some short natives or tall natives nearby, a pheasant quail would go into that. Um, you know, good luck to the to the neighborhood hawk trying to pick a pick a bird out of there. And uh, it's also a good idea to plant trees of value into these. And it could be an oak, it could be a cedar. It just depends on what you want to do. If you want it for a bedding area, you might be a little more inclined to plant something like a cedar into that area. 
Um, if you want your grandkids and their grandkids to enjoy a nice oak area that they can hunt over with some acorns, you might want to plant some oaks. And feel free to stop me if you guys have questions at all. Uh, edge feathering is the next thing I'll talk about. Um, you see that soft edge effect up there. And, and what I like to tell people is that in Iowa, we have hard edges everywhere where natives run up to a mature forest or a cornfield or soybean field or some other kind of field runs up to a mature forest. Um, that's not good for wildlife. These soft edges, they provide more security. Um, again, you can use it to funnel deer. If you want to hang a stand over a, over a, a food plot or something like that, that's a great, that's a great way to dictate where those deer move. And also, uh, ideal escape cover for upland game. If you edge feather next to natives and your neighborhood hawk comes in and he wants to pick off your one rooster pheasant that's still hanging on or your one hen pheasant that's still hanging on, those birds fly into there and they're safe. Um, and again, diversity. You add diversity by doing this. And a lot of people with edge feathering, they'll go out and they'll, uh, they'll spray an area where they're going to drop their trees just to kill everything off. It'll come up to annual weeds and eventually some, some little trees and, and shrubs and things like that. Um, so it starts succession over. And uh, it's also good to screen food plots. When you're sitting in your house and eating, you don't want all the neighbors to be in looking at you. You want to feel safe, you want to feel secure. So when I say screen, that's what I'm talking about. You're just creating a safe environment for those animals that use it. That's just a picture of a fall edge. Um, you can see it's still really thick, even though there's, there's no leaves or anything on the trees. Um, and that's a summer picture of the, of the same area. And uh, you can kind of see what I mean by soft edge. You get, you get a little bit of trees and shrubs right on the edge, and then you get into your taller trees. And you want to do it ideally in conjunction with a native grass and four buffer. And uh, you'll see my beautiful artwork here. It's just kind of showing the, the stair step effect that we're looking for. Top is obviously your mature trees. Then you're getting into your shrubs and then your native grass buffer. That area would be beautiful for a cubby of quail if they're still hanging on. And another reason to do it is hard edges yield poorly. You can see by that picture how the, uh, the corn doesn't grow so well up against that timber. Those trees are blocking all the sunlight to that corn and they're also robbing it from all its moisture. In a lot of cases, you, you get paid better by putting your, your edges in CRP or something along those lines. And you can see on the right, that's just uh, what the ears look like in that same field. It wouldn't come hardest time. They're pretty poor over on the left-hand side. talk about native grasses and forbs next. Probably my favorite topic. When you're talking native grasses and forbs, diversity is key. Lots of flowers, lots of different grasses. Um, your benefits, your pheasant quail want to nest in this and their chicks want to get in there and pick insects. Um, they have food value, believe it or not. You can plant your natives to <coughs> have some of the native legumes in it, like partridge pea or uh, prairie clover. Deer love that stuff, and it'll encourage them to bed in it. Um, obviously, it's great bedding for deer, great place for does to hide fawns, so you get a little bit more recruitment on your properties. And uh, it's another great way to hide food plots. This guy in the back, Tyler Bass, he, uh, he's got some food plots on his place. 
and uh, I got a chance to see earlier this year shed hunting with him. And you'll see a picture of one earlier or later in the presentation, but there's just a whole gob of deer out there and it's hit on one side by timber and the other side by tall native grasses. And, and you can tell why those deer feel safe in there and, and why he chose to put that food plot where it is. So why do we want diversity? Well, upland species, they need those diverse native grasses and forbs for food and cover. Um, for one, it creates different height structures. And, and that benefits more than just pheasant and quail. Your songbirds love that as well. Um, and that's something that is kind of missing from our landscape. You know, back in the, in the days when Iowa was prairie, we had elk and bison grazing our prairies. And that helped create those different height structures. And that's why Lewis and Clark, their favorite place when they went on their expedition was going through Iowa. Elk and buffalo and deer and everything else galore. Um, and natives grow in clumps. And you can kind of see here the big clumps of some of your different grasses and a little bit of bare ground around them. That allows your pheasant quail broods to move in and out freely. Uh, they can't move freely in, in brome grass or even solid switch grass. And it'll, it'll, uh, it'll discourage them from using it even if you haven't run a fire through it for too many years and you've got too much duff on the ground. So, uh, and, and the forbs, the flowers, the wildflowers, they attract insects, which comprises, what is it, Tyler, like 80% of a chick's diet in the first six weeks? Uh, yeah, 80 to 90%. So you need insects on your, on your properties if you want your pheasant quail to, uh, to survive. And pollinator habitat, um, that's kind of diverse natives on steroids. You're talking way fewer grasses and way more um, forbs. And that's the best nesting and brood rearing for your upland game. More forbs, less grass, like I said. And it increases the ground space and presence of insects. Um, it's like us going to a buffet. So, and some research even suggests that having pollinator habitat next to your, your bean fields or your corn fields will actually increase the yield because it increases the pollination of those, of those crops. That's a picture from, from Northwest Iowa, um, taken by one of my colleagues in the DNR. That place is, you know, you can tell by looking at it, it's just crawling with pheasants. And it's a, it's a, you know, a pothole. You can see the wet one out there, but I just wanted to throw that picture and I think it's kind of pretty. Um, I'll talk about switchgrass next. I just want to start off by saying, don't plant the entire farm to switch. We all love switch, especially you deer guys, especially if you're on Iowa Whitetail. I know, uh, I know they, they talk it up pretty good there. But it is best used in conjunction with native grasses and forbs. And I say that because switch grass is not ideal for nesting or brood rearing pheasant or quail rabbits don't even like it. It grows in too thick and they just cannot move around. Um, it's great to plant in odd areas. Uh, you know, if you have a little three acre field here or, or something like that, it's perfect because that's really too small for good pheasant or quail habitat anyways. And uh, you know, those areas are just, they're too easily predated. If you're trying to raise pheasants or raise quail, um, 20 acres is your ideal nesting or in brood rearing habitat. So, uh, and it obviously provides some winter benefits. Um, it stands when your other natives won't. Your big blue stem, your Indian grass, even your little blue stem. We all uh, know how bad our blizzard was before Christmas, and I can tell you that the big blue Indian grass dominated natives up around me, I live north of Bondurant, they laid flat, and they're still flat, and they don't stand up. Switch will lay flat for a little while, but it'll spring itself back up and, and keep providing that good winter habitat. Great way to screen in your food plots, too. Um, this picture is taken in that towards the end of the 2008-2009 winter where um, if you were deer hunting during muzzleloader season like me, 
you were walking through about two feet of snow the whole season, and it was bitterly cold. That switch stood up the entire winter. That picture was uh, taken in March, so you can you can see why it provides that good that good winter habitat, bedding, thermal cover for deer, pheasant, turkey, quail, whatever. Um, in this picture, all this stuff laying down is big blue stem and Indian grass. All this stuff standing up is switchgrass. So you can tell the difference. That was from the same winter. So what are the pros to switchgrass? Well, it's great tall winter cover for upland game and deer. Um, great bedding, thermal cover. They can, they can lay down in there and, and keep warm. And like I said, it, it stands up to harsh winters where other natives may not and usually won't. Um, and it is pretty easy to establish. Switchgrass seed is, is very hard. It's got a hard seed coat. So what, what I usually recommend people do is, is uh, called a frost seeding. You broadcast it out on frozen ground. And through the process of freezing and thawing throughout the winter, it'll, uh, it'll soften up that seed coat. And, and that seed will be ready to germinate as soon as, as, soon as the temperatures uh, come up. And you can even take that a step further and spray it in the spring with a Roundup Atrazine type mix. Um, and you can have it established pretty fast. And like I said earlier, there are some cons. Um, there's very little nesting or brugering potential for switchgrass. It just gets too thick. And there's no food value in it either, where with your native, uh, with your other natives um, and your diverse mixes, there is some food value to that. And it can be aggressive, um, so it's got to be managed accordingly. A lot, of, uh, a lot of seed mixes you'll get, and even from PF, you get the opportunity to buy seed mixes that don't have switchgrass in them, because that switchgrass has proven over time that it can take over a really expensive seed mix. And I thought I'd better throw a little bit in about fire since we got done talking about natives. Um, that is the way to manage your native anything, whether it be a diverse mix or just solid switchgrass. Um, fire is something that's been suppressed for a long time, and you can understand why. If there was a settler that had a house on the top of that hill, they were probably pretty scared of fire. But. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's a necessary. It's a necessary thing. We need to bring it back. Um, it helps rejuvenate the stands by killing off some of the weed competition, um, getting rid of the thick duff layer that'll grow after four or five years of growing. Um, you can have a really nice diverse native grass stand if it's got too much duff in it. It'll be just like switchgrass. Those birds, they won't be encouraged to nest in it because they can't get around. The chicks can. So with the prairies, um, like I said, it, it suppresses invasives. Um, and timely burns is, is important. If you're, burning, uh, if you're burning in June and you expect your warm season grasses to do OK after that, you can think again. And likewise, um, if you're burning too, too early and you want cool seasons to do OK, you're going to knock them out. Uh, and it's needed to maintain diverse plantings like I said, it cleans up the duff. And you can burn in fall or spring, but just make sure you get some professional advice. Uh, because if you've got you know, a, a seed mix that's mostly warm season grasses, if you burn at the wrong time, you might not ever see it again. And same with your forbs. Fall burning is great for forbs. Obviously, with, uh, with fall burns, you kind of run the risk of losing a little bit of habitat. Um, but you got to think long term, and you have to also understand that you don't have to burn everything at once. So, if you've got a if you've got a seed mix that's really heavy on the flowers, fall burns are great, but don't burn at all. Uh, but doing so gives your forbs a better chance to to hang on. And in timber, again, it suppresses invasives. Um, timber burns are tough. Tyler would probably agree with me there, uh, but. When done correctly, it'll promote native and desirable woodland legumes and forbs. And there's more of those out there than you think. And, and they're hanging on in areas that you would never believe they are. Um, and, you know, 
legumes and forbs. That's what you're talking about for feeding your animals in those in those uh, harsh months where there's not a ton of food available. So it also creates natural revegetation and, and cleans up unwanted dead material. If you got a timber that that uh, had a big storm go through it or something, and you just got dead stuff laying all over the place, a couple consecutive years of burning will open up that forest floor again and, and give all your good stuff a chance to come back. Tree and shrub plantings is what I'm going to talk about next. And uh, they can be tricky, and I just want you all to know that right off the bat. Uh, you buy them from the Iowa State Nursery. They are pretty cheap. And they're cheap for a reason because they can be difficult to establish. Uh, generally, I tell people you have to do some kind of weed control if you want a majority of your planted trees and shrubs to survive. They can uh, they can really disappoint you if if there's not some kind of weed control, and a lot of times watering them is necessary as well. Um, but they provide some great benefits in, in established areas. And I can tell this picture is kind of hard to see, but we have back here what we refer to as a quail cubby headquarter. Um, dense planting of shrubs that provide berries throughout most of the growing season. And, and that's where those quail like to hide when, uh, when something's chasing them or, or whatnot. Um, and why would you do it? Well. It's escape and winter cover. We all know that we need cover. Berries equal food. Um, with the right species, you'll have berries throughout your growing season. And it adds diversity. It's, it's something to uh, throw into your, into your management plants to mix things up. And they can also act as windbreaks or living snow fences to uh, protect your, your desirable native grasses or your food plots. Um, whatever it is you wish. And that's just a picture of, of kind of a typical windbreak that you'd see in Iowa. Um, but as a wildlife person, I would say you need some natives right here, or even weeds or food plot or something like that. But that's where those birds are going to go when the going gets tough in the winter and the snow flies. So they, it's a necessary thing. And this is just an example of a shrub I like to put out. Wild plum, it establishes pretty easy, it creates dense cover, uh, provides a lot of pollination opportunities for your bugs and insects and songbirds and things like that. And uh, you can see all the berries that come off of those. You need deer like that? They sure do. And with the food plots, um, <coughs> There's a lot of things you guys can put out there. It really comes down to deciding what you want, deciding your needs, and planting accordingly. Um, obviously, putting out a food plot, you're going to increase the amount of food available on your property, and you're going to provide winter cover and food, um, depending on what you plant. And also, increase your hunting opportunities and, and, uh, and success. We all know how hard it can be to peg that big buck that's out there, but if he's got something he really likes eating, your odds go up. You know where he's going to be eventually. So food plots for deer. Um, Tyler, have you had much luck with small corn or bean plots on your, on your places? Nope, not at all. Not at all. If they're going to be a smart, if I I do a small uh, corner bean plot. It's usually two or three acres of a very big field. Mm -hmm. That's how I usually stick to it because a smaller field just doesn't work. But there are other options. Obviously, your corn and beans, all the wildlife loves that stuff. It's standing cover, especially with corn, and it's nutritional value. But uh, in my opinion, if you're talking a, a small plot, one, two, maybe three acres, a green browse mix is, uh, is your best bet, and there's plenty of mixes out there that have something green all through the growing season. Um, you can plant stuff that you can hunt in October, you can plant stuff that you can hunt in December, 
and you can even incorporate them into the same areas. And this is actually information I got from Tyler. He's been doing this for a long time on his farm. Um, he likes using clover mixes with some chicory. And uh, they are peren perennial. They'll keep coming back. I mean, how often do you have to replant those clover and chicory? Uh, it just depends on the area. Usually a uh, minimum of three years, and sometimes they'll go up to four, maybe five years at okay. most. So they'll attract animals throughout the year. Um, almost always going to be something green. And, and I've personally seen, seen some deer dig through a lot of snow for some good green browse, even when there's some corner beans next to it. Uh, great for spring turkey hunting, those green areas. We all have seen that tom out there strutting on that beautiful green field. Uh, so it's, it's a good opportunity to, uh, to peg down some, some spring toms. Um, and there are some brood rearing opportunities in clover if you leave it undisturbed during the nesting season. And when I say that, I'm talking don't bale it or mow it or anything like that until after, what, July 15th or something along those lines. And then you're free. But if you leave it good and tall, uh, those pheasant quail broods, they can get around in there and the flowers provide the insects that they need. Uh, brassicas and turnips is a great option if you're looking for a for a late winter food plot to hunt, you know, late bow season or shotgun or, or late muzzleloader. Um, you can you can seed them into sparse or failed corn or bean plots plots too. So if you didn't listen to my advice and you went out there and tried to plant that one acre of beans and they were all gone by July, um, go in with some brassicas, broadcast them, work them in in August and uh, if you get some timely rains they'll do well. Uh, so they're best for late season after a heavy frost. Uh, the glucose comes up in them after a freeze and they turn kind of sweet. Um, I know a picture of Tyler's farm was at a turnip plot that by January pretty much all of them were, were dug up. Yep, They worked it hard. And that's where those deer were during late months of order. So they're very attractive to deer with that sweet forage. Uh, food plot for upland species. Most of the time we're talking standing corn and sorghum, uh, but I've already kind of discussed some of the issues I see with small corn plots. Sorghum is not quite the same. Uh, deer won't really get into it very much so if you're in a in an area that's got a, a high density of deer uh, sorghum is a good is a good bet now I said it's for upland species because you're not gonna shoot that booner buck over a, over a sorghum plot but they do stand very tall um, they come in very thick they stand up to heavy winter heavy wind heavy snow and uh, also the seed with them is a little bit more readily available than corn. Uh, a wendel, you can see the big seed heads up here. Those seeds are heavy too. A good strong wind every now and then will knock some of that seed onto the ground where, uh, where your pheasant, quail, turkeys, whatever it is, can take advantage of it. Corn's a little more difficult. Um, I know a lot of people in northwest Iowa that, that can get away with planting corn food plots They've got to go in and knock some of that stuff down, otherwise the birds can't get to it as well. Did I miss anything there? But with the corn, if you have the option, um, you know, if you have a 40 or an 80 of corn, talk to your talk to your tenant farmer, or if you're farming it yourself, just leave some of it. That's your best bet if you want corn late in the year. And you can also use those plots to protect sensitive areas. Uh, diverse natives, your green browse plots that, that are uh, susceptible to deep, heavy snow, uh, things of that nature. And uh, you can leave them dirty. Um, and when I say dirty, I mean don't hit it with Roundup or as heavy as a dose. Let some of that, those annual weeds come in, foxtail, ragweed, things of that nature. And I just threw that picture up there because uh, 
back in the day, I remember seeing a lot of cornfields that after they were picked had foxtail in them. Dale's shaking his head. You remember that? And you don't see that much anymore. No bugs. No bugs. You're right. So that pheasant's pretty happy in there. Cover crops is the next thing. Um, cover crops is is kind of the new wave as far as I'm concerned. Uh, not a whole lot of farmers are utilizing them, but the research is there that uh, it benefits a lot of things, not just wildlife. And uh, you think deer like that field at all? That they do. And that's just a picture showing area of this field that was uh, harvested for silage, I believe. That's not planted to cover crops, that's planted to winter rye. Um, that rye is great, great food for wildlife. And uh, it's, it's an opportunity on your properties too, if you have big ag type fields. Work cover crops into your lease or into your crop rotation, that's, that's another opportunity to both feed and hunt those wildlife. Um, and there's a cover crop available for almost any crop rotation, whether it be seed corn or silage, um, soybeans, etc. There's something available. And there's a good pamphlet back here if you haven't grabbed it yet that, that shows some of those things and when you need to plant it, um, what they do for wildlife, what they do for your soil. It's been proven over and over and over and over again that cover crops help control weeds naturally. They reduce compaction, depending on what you use. Uh, they reduce erosion. This field with rain or wind, on that right side, I can guarantee that, that you're losing soil. Um, and the left side, not so much. There's a root system in there holding that soil together, and it's also protected from the wind. And when you do that, you increase the organic matter of your soil. And so on the left side, when it rains, it's not going to all run off. It's going to soak in. On that right side, you're going to start to see some gullies form if you have a if you have a heavy rain. So that's just a good opportunity to protect your soil on your properties and also provide some more uh, incentives to wildlife. And with food plots, try and bring all the components together. Everything I talked about: natives, edge feathering, timber stand improvement. Um, you can tell why those deer are comfortable. This is all timber over here and it runs around <coughs> this way and up on top of the hill. Tyler's got some good tall native grasses. He's got an easy way to get into his stand pretty much undetected and those deer feel comfortable and that's why they've hit that field so hard. And some of you get a kick out of this. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know what that is offhand? I got some of that. <laughs> Weeds have what wildlife needs. Weeds is something that is missing from our landscape in Iowa. Um, you know, I made the reference to uh, cornfields that used to have foxtail in them. And I remember as a kid pheasant hunting with my dad, shooting roosters in those fields. Not the thickest cover ever, but there's bugs in them, and, and uh, this is a picture of ragweed. The single most nutritious native plant in Iowa to pheasants and quail. You don't see much of it anymore. But if you disc or spray hot areas on your farms, it'll come back. And uh, it's cheap habitat. A little bit of Roundup or a little bit of disking. You get some weeds out there. Not the prettiest stuff in the world but uh, it helps. Those weed stands are very diverse and nutritious. Um, they provide a great ratio of overhead cover to bare ground. So when those pheasants or, or quail hatch, they got a place to run around and, uh, and they're protected overhead from, from the predators. And they could be good for doves and dove hunting also. And I threw that in there because I've got a, a ragweed patch on on my place that I shot a lot of doves over this year. 
it's that seed. Ragweed produces a lot of seed, and those birds like it. It's especially good for quail if you use it in conjunction with, with some of the shrub plantings I've talked about. Um, the DNR recommends with your cubby headquarters a 30 by 50 area, 1,500 square feet of shrubs, surrounded by natives, and uh, either a, a weed patch or a food plot on one side of it. If you're struggling for money, throw in some weeds by spraying a little bit of Roundup or something. And Oak Savannah is something that uh, I was encouraged by my boss to put in here. I didn't originally have it in, uh, in my presentation, but oaks are, are something in Iowa that we're losing. Um, they just don't have the opportunity to grow in those, in those open areas like that anymore. And up where I live, the predominant tree is a bur oak, but they're all average of probably 200 years old and there's not many new ones around. Oak savannas originally, when Iowa was depopulated by the glaciers and, and the tall grass prairie formed, oak savannas were kind of the middle points between more heavily wooded timber areas and just your, your landscape of, of native grasses and forbs. Um, they've got a little bit of everything. Go back quick. This picture here is is uh, more of an open type savanna, and you can see all the warm season grasses in here. Um, this next picture is is uh, more remnant of a of an actual savanna that's dominated by cool season grasses, but timber stand improvement has been used extensively to to begin the restoration on these oak savannas, and. Uh, I hope you don't think I'm contradicting myself after that, that uh, spiel I, I gave you about open timber not providing wildlife much cover. This is a little different story because of the understory. Native warm seasons are going to grow about yay high. Your cool season's a little shorter, obviously, but imagine what a, what a deer would feel like if, if they could lay down in grass this tall and have acorns all around them. I mean that's that's one of the most the single most nutritious foods for deer and, and uh, turkeys, and they're very scenic. Songbirds love them. Cavity nesting birds love them. Uh, and like I said, acorns are one of the single most nutritious foods for wildlife. So if you have an area that's got a lot of oaks on it, um, you might think about doing an oak savanna restoration. I know Tyler. You've done some oak savanna work. Absolutely, yep. How have, uh, how have you got that done cost-wise for your landowners? Um, it just depends. It depends on what program you get into, whether it's state or federal program. But, uh, you know, the cost share for it is, uh, is not as much as what you would think. I mean, it is a little bit more costly. Um, you know, you're going to look at anywhere from probably three to $500 an acre, if not a little bit more, to get it done. And the cost share is probably going to be anywhere from 60 to... 140, 150. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some money out of your pocket, but uh, the biggest point of this is, you know, an oak savanna goes hand in hand with a lot of stuff you've talked about. If you can create a patch of this, a patch of that, in and around an oak savanna, you know, down in Missouri they're doing a lot of things with oak savannas, and it's proven that uh, turkey numbers um, and the turkey uh, production in those areas with oak savannas are is just booming. So uh, turkeys prefer prefer an area like that rather than a thick timber. Mm -hmm. So. Good points. And when he's talking five to six hundred bucks an acre or so, I mean what, five to seven years, maybe more, spread out over time. I mean you're talking lots of burning. Yep. Lots of tree cutting. Yep, a lot of the stuff that we've done, you know, that the first year we dropped those trees, we're running fire through it, and we'll run fire through it for three or four years in a row, um, to start seeing the benefits of it. But once you do, you're going to start seeing a lot of your, you know, your woodland forbs, your, your woodland rise start popping up uh, and coming up in there, and, and that's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it takes time. So you need lots of fire, and it's like Tyler said, um, there's good native seed almost everywhere in Iowa, but it, it takes some work to, uh, to get it to show itself. Um, it takes a lot of TSI, depending on the area. There's some areas in Iowa, my property, for example, is... Uh, 
old pasture, and it is oak savanna. Um, the only thing we would need to do is probably kill off all the old cool seasons that aren't any good and, and give the natives a chance to pop up. Maybe doing some seeding, but uh, like I said, remnant savannas being grazed is a whole different story than your remnant savannas that are, that are grown into junk trees. Um, obviously, the savanna that's choked out by a lot of trees is going to be more costly and, and more time consuming to restore, but the benefits are there. Do you consider the hickory tree not to be a value tree? Um, hickory doesn't provide much to wildlife. Most of the guys I know that are doing TSI for deer, um, that's the first thing they go in and cut because it does uh, it does compete with your good trees a lot. They grow big and tall and, and close up the canopy. So, but some of the old uh, some of the old you know oak savanna type areas are actually old oak hickory forests. So it's not to say they don't have their place on the landscape, but it just depends on what your what your goals are for your property. I wanted to throw a little bit about wetlands in here too. Um, obviously, we all know that Iowa used to be covered with them, and they're not anymore. They've been tiled, they're being farmed, etc. Um, there's still areas out there, even crop ground, that is historically wet, doesn't produce well, that there's a lot of opportunities to uh, restore some wetlands and, and to do it more on the government's dime than your own. Um, WRP is a program that's a permanent easement. It can be up to 100% cost share and you get a one-time payment. Um, CRP's also got some wetland restoration programs. That 10 years ago was a, a crop field in Northwest Iowa. And you can tell what the benefits would be. And if you're a duck hunter, that's a, that's a dream right there. But you see all the good upland habitat around it, providing some the pheasants and deer and turkey and quail <clears throat> opportunities as well. And just to show you it's possible, these are this is a sequence of pictures from a colleague of mine in north central Iowa that works mostly with wetlands up there. Um, perennial hay ground here. The landowner decided that it wasn't worth it. That green area was, was too wet to hay most of the time. So we, he came to my colleague and, and said, I'd like a wetland here. And he got into a program. And uh, they started the restoration. So they probably plugged some tile and, and put a few ditch plugs in to keep that water backed up in that area. And that's it, five years later. That's a wetland. And those cattails is where the pheasants are going to be in the winter. And you can see, like the first picture I showed you, that there's a, there's a lot of good upland habitat there. Um, obviously, our landscape down here is a little bit different than north central Iowa. But wetlands can still have a place on your farms. It's like it grows windmills. Yeah. <laughs> So considering all the things I've talked about, um, I don't want you to think just about your individual properties. Um, Tyler will tell you that his management got a lot better once he started talking to his neighbors, sharing deer cam pictures and, and things of that nature. So don't think your own property, think the landscape around you. What does your neighbor have? Um, what's your neighbor doing for wildlife? What, what could you do uh, to, to put something different on the landscape that would benefit you know, whatever, whatever species of wildlife that you'd like to manage for? Cooperative is a, is a word we throw around, around a lot in my profession. Um, and I can tell you, the, the guys that cooperate with their landowners, and I understand it's not always possible, some of them are pains in the butt. But the guys that cooperate with their landowners one, they have more fun, they make great friends, but their wildlife benefits as well. Uh, that's pretty much it for the, 
for the habitat practices, but I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, some of the cost share programs we use to um, put this habitat on the ground. CRP is a big one. If you don't know anything about it, there's a good pamphlet back there. Um, it provides an annual rental rate. It's a 10 or 15 year contract and you get cost share to establish uh, whatever it is, whether it be a wetland or a diverse native prairie. Um, you get cost share to help get that going. WIP is one that's kind of gone by the wayside. It is actually combined with this program we call EQUIP. Um, that's short for the Environmental Quality Inc Incentive Program. And there's a ranking process with that, but EQUIP is a great way to get timber stand work done. It's a great way to get uh, edge feathering or, or what they refer to as early successional habitat development done. Um, Tyler, what is that? About 50% cost share for, for the program? For EQUIP? Uh, equip and just yeah, roughly 50 to 65 percent uh, cost here, depending on what you do. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of you know, it's really I really don't talk to landowners in the way of uh, percentages because really all those figures that we work on are uh, are basically rates, and they're supposed to justify roughly 50 50 to 65 percent. Um, but to say if you're going to do like a native prairie uh, establishment, you know, you're going to get roughly 200 bucks an acre. Now that might be 50 percent depending on what you have to do. Uh, so just, just know that it's not really based on percentages, it's more based on certain rates that are supposed to justify roughly what that percentage is. But yeah, you're pretty close. There you go. Uh, REAP's another one, that's a state program, resource enhancement program. Um, up to 75% cost share depending on what you want to do. And, and I should add that CRP has got some requirements, you have to have owned it for a year. Um, and it has to be on crop ground that meets a cropping history requirement, which currently is, it has to have been farmed four out of six years from 2002 to 2007. Um, but that's why they pay that annual rental rate, because they know that you can't just throw away your crop value for the land. Um, reap and equip, you're not going to get an annual rental rate. That's just money to help you establish it. PF chapters will jump on sometimes if, if you're doing so many acres of CRP and you want good pheasant habitat, they'll help you pay for some of the seed. Um, numerous practice, or chapters also have burn units. They've got equipment so that you could plant your food plots or plant your grasses. Um, so keep that in mind and, and you know feel free to look up on iowapf.net, your, uh, your local president and they'd be able to direct you towards any resources that they have. Prairie Partners is another one that's, that's done by the Iowa DNR, and basically that's a, it's a coupon. Um, if you want to buy some seed and put it down, you get 50% off, more or less. Uh, other ones, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Service, sometimes they'll jump on with wetland restorations, sometimes they'll jump on with oak savanna type stuff. Um, it just depends on, you know, what their goals are, and uh, what kind of money they have available. And there's more than that, too. So what I hope for you guys to do is uh, call me after this is over, or, or uh, I had the Iowa DNR private lands program staff maps back there. Call your local person. They'll help you get hooked up with these programs, and they'll help you design your habitat on your, on your uh, properties. So that being said, are there any questions? On the uh, cover crop or food plots, sure. you mentioned Milo. Is there a reason why? Um, no, not really. Uh, Milo's got its place. Okay. Doves love it. But uh, I just I just didn't go very in-depth, so I didn't name okay, everything off. But uh, any other questions? Anybody want me to go back to any of these slides? I hope I didn't go too fast. I feel like I hate to admit my ignorance, but when you burn off a timber, our timber is really thick. It's mm -hmm. not been grazed or anything for years. You, you wait a certain time of year, the spring and the fall. Uh, when's, the, when's the best time? Do you have to have an, an army of people to burn it off, or you can burn it off with a small that's a, that's a good question, and, and it's hard to answer. I kind of remember your timber going up into it a little bit. 
and, and I remember it being thick. Um, your best bet would be spring or fall, whichever, but spring preferably so that through the fall there's a little bit more cover in there. Timber burns can be a finicky thing. Sometimes they take off, but they're generally slower moving. Um, they don't always burn everything, so in the spring you'll have your, your layer of dead leaves and things like that to help carry that fire. Um, I've done timber burns with two people. I've done timber burns that took 15. You know, it's <coughs> harder to establish a fire break in a, in a timber burn, you know, unless you have something natural like a, a creek bed or a stream or something, you know. I've spent five hours making a fire break with a rake and a leaf blower. Um, and then another couple hours burning off of that just to make sure we had a good black line. So it all depends, but uh, there's plenty of people that you could contract to do that kind of work, you know, especially if you're scared of it. I know, I know when I first started burning, um, it was kind of a scary thing. I mean, <laughs> we burnt some, I think my first burn was on a, a switchgrass field that stood about yay tall. It was cave and rock switchgrass. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember seeing that fire come up the hill at me. You know, I was behind the black line, but uh, <laughs> like, holy smokes. <laughs> so I understand, but there's plenty of people out there that would help you with it. And do you need to wait for soil temperature, temperatures to get to a certain point, or just any time? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'll, you'll do better in timber when your relative humidity is a lot lower, you know, 30 to 40 percent. Um, and, and like I said, you know, in my opinion, you don't want to do it too super early. Um, I prefer spring over fall, just just because I'd rather uh, I'd rather see some of that litter be on the ground for in the fall for the wildlife and such. But uh, the idea behind it is, you know, when you burn through that timber, if you get a good burn, the ground's black. Any of the good seed in there is going to warm up because that black ground is going to warm up faster in the sun and germinate quicker and, and it gives your, your native stuff a little better opportunity to come up. What are you talking about late April? Early April? Late Early April. April. Right now? Right now. It's well, different the for prairie grasses. Yep. Then you have to let the, the ground temperature warm up, right? Yeah, I mean you want to. Um, but it just depends on, on what you got, you know. Like I said, cool season grasses, if you want your cool seasons to do well, don't burn them when they're starting to green up. You're going to hurt them. Which is what? Is that your little blue stem and you know? Uh, you're talking more like fox sedge or, you know, what you see out is out in the fields. It's old CRPs like brown, um, things of that nature. Your warm season is your little blue, your big blue, your switch. Indian grass, stuff like that. So, timing's important. Yes? Yeah. Will the presentation and or video be available online for others? Uh, I could sure make it available. I could sure make it available. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I know I, uh, I worked the Pheasants Forever booth at the Deer Classic and, and had a less extensive version of this looping in there and and uh, some people asked for it so it's it's looped at a couple uh, PF chapter banquets and a guy from the county conservation board is going to use it in a few different spots so I'd be happy to make it available just make sure I've got your email um, and I can send it out to you and then you can distribute it as necessary sure how about, that? How about the video as far as the video eventually yeah, YouTube yeah. or photo bucket or something like that. Oh, the YouTube. Okay, sure. Fair enough. Yeah. Pop it up there. That'd be great. Fair enough. Thanks. Well, I hope you guys got something out of this. Um, if you've been extensively managing your ground for a while, this might have been a little bit introductory to, to for you. Uh, but like I said, hopefully you got something out of it. Hopefully you can kind of form some goals and and based on what you want to do on your properties and and. Get a hold of me. I'll get a hold of you uh, in the next coming weeks, and I'll help you out, design your places, get you some cost share, etc. So, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks Thank you. you. Thank you.